Like, this is much better than expected. It's like once every week, there's sun. It's like, okay, good luck. <laughs> Look, we've, we've been super lucky during uh, the whole Corona lockdown. It's been beautiful like every single day, which means park walks. So it's. Uh -huh. Yeah. I was about to tell you that you would be cursed because you wouldn't be able to go out if you were here. <laughs> we had the curfews. Oh, well, we could, we could get out, but uh, luckily the weather cooperated. It hasn't been raining. I mean, what, what good is it if you can go out if it's pouring down rain? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, so I hope uh, everything is settled. And well, I heard everything is a little bit more settled in London than it was before. Yeah. So. Okay, starting to move around a little bit. I looked at the uh, the city mapper index, and it was saying twenty percent plus of the city is moving now. So okay, yeah. So uh, you and I have a few uh, areas of interest in the investment side, which not many people have. You as a, you are an angel in Memphis Meet, I guess. I, I am. Yes, I'm a very small angel. Uh, I'm almost the uh, smallest. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's usually my case. So, uh, but still, I, I also invested in an uh, insect-based protein company uh, that's trying to pick up, which is not many people have those <laughs> funny investments in their portfolio. That's a good, good starter. So I'll, I'll start by, with, with that wing, I'll, I'll start by saying, are you uh, looking for these contrarian areas uh, in your personal portfolio where you where you or is your personal portfolio or personal investment mandate is as much people have as like only people based you're right so for personal stuff um so memphis meets actually came from my midlife crisis which was trying to look at how i can make profit and make a difference so yeah i'm right there <laughs> Because I, it's my, you know, it's my, it's a personal investment. So there's no limited partner. No one give me the money. It's not a yeah, yeah. right. It's my, I can do what I want to with it. Um, and in their case, I mean, they're saving, you know, 10 X on water, 10 X on land mass, 10 X on um, greenhouse emissions. Uh, it's hormone free meat. There's no murder, yeah. no animal cruelty, you know, check, 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 check. Yeah. And if it were no cancer check, no, no obesity, well, if you can eat, if you eat too much, maybe you can, but. Clearly, but, and, and then uh, I think the last thing is it's the meat market, which is a multi-trillion dollar market. Um, so it's gigantic. And now you look at, uh, for example, COVID, uh, the, all the meat processing factories in the U.S. Yeah. Problems, et cetera. So, yeah, it's, uh, yeah. But, like, food as a space is, is super interesting to me on, on a personal level. And also mobility and banking or um, alternative banking, alternative uh, finance. Yeah. So that's so, so mobility and banking are both professional and personal. Yes. So I learned, I, I mean, I stole this from Larry and Sergey at Google. When, when they're looking at making an acquisition, they look at a company and they ask, does it pass the toothbrush test? I.e., do you use the product twice a day? All yeah. Right. So... I mean, clearly, if you look at fintech businesses, especially if it's your actual bank, I mean, how many times a day do you touch your bank? Numerous, right? Yeah. So it very easily passes the toothbrush test. Um, then if you look at mobility, in some cases, it definitely passes the toothbrush test. So if you think, so yeah. we're investors in Lime. Um, yeah. I mean, a lot of folks will use a Lime bike or scooter to go to um. work at night. There you go. That's you know, twice. Yeah. Um, and even things like, you know, Uber or, um, you know, Deliveroo, you're going to use that many times a month, right? So these are hugely valuable businesses. So <clears throat> when I'm looking at mobility and fintech banking, I'm definitely thinking about the old toothbrush test. Yeah. And in Turkey, I did an investment on the um, Uber for uh, motorcycles called Scuddy. Great. So... I had been doing great until the COVID. So they had the same problems that Lime did when people were off the streets. It's a different problem. Now Istanbul traffic is picking up. It's a, it's a, probably it's going to be a different uh, journey going forward. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think that kind of post COVID, <laughs> bless you. Um, Thank you. 
micro mobility is really going to increase significantly. I think Absolutely. China, they're already reporting that automotive sales have really gone up. Um, yep. Don't want to take public transport. They don't want to be in crowded. Yep. My personal vote is let's try and use bicycles or electric scooters instead of cars, please. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, if, if you look at the, um, the pollution problems in London. Yeah, it's, it's just gone. gone. But, you know, this morning, because like, I can actually see one of the bridges that crosses mm -hmm. the Thames River from, from where I live. And if I look out, it's mostly bicycles going across the bridge. Yes. And cars. So, you know, I'm kind of optimistic that, uh, that yeah. the changes are going to happen. We're going to have less cars, less pollution, more pedestrian, more bicycles yeah. and e-scooters, et cetera. E -scooter, more micro what's, the, what's the e-scooter situation in Istanbul right now? So there are a few companies who raised a good amount of money. Uh, but Istanbul has its own geographical challenges in terms of where you can actually use uh, e-scooter effectively right. so i'm actually working with a company i haven't invested in them yet but uh they will be providing an infrastructure to e-scooter companies so that's that's a much better uh option because i don't think people will be taking this self-driving uh let me drive to my charging station kind of e-bikes i think that that'll take some time so these guys i'm working with are building an infrastructure where Nobody needs to pick them up. You can, as a person, can go and lock it in a random or unified charging station that will be a lot in a lot of places. Yeah, yeah. I've I've actually uh, spoken to a company here that's trying to do that as well. Kind of taking a shipping container and it becomes a storage. Uh, storage. Oh, that's a, and, and charging station. Yeah, that's a, that's interesting. One thing I also need to thank you is Peak. Uh, both my daughter and I am using that on a, almost a daily basis. So that's, let's, that passes the toothbrush test for me. Let's, let's clarify which peak we're talking about, not the... The brain. Not, yeah, no. The brain. Yeah. Just exited. Yeah, that would have been a nice exit, but the not brain right. game is much... Yeah. Did you uh, miss investing in the peak games uh, in uh, Qualcomm? The, which, which, which peak? The uh, one... So the large peak and the small peak. Right. The, so the 1.8 peak. Right. So I, I did the smaller peak. Um, yes, and, that I yeah. like. Yes. And uh, I we didn't look at the large peak at Qualcomm. Mm. So that's, there, were, there, were, there are always two peaks out there. Um, yeah, yeah. Very confusing. The brain training so now, I did. The brain training. Yeah, I got, I got involved in the seed round there. So, that, so that was, that's a good case of... Um, people and their prior experience really leading the charge. Uh, the guys building it had come out of Playfish, so they had mm -hmm. good games experience. And then on the management side, they were ex Google, Amazon, um, and I want to say McKinsey as well. So, kind of you know, re really yeah. great um, experience coming into the business. They had a prototype for me to look at. And I literally, I wrote the check before Peak was actually built. It was called Brainbow Games when I did the investment. Mm -hmm. So the reason, the reason I'm going between your professional and personal investments to, to, to tie it into fundraising advice for startups, mm -hmm. because with GR Capital, you only do co-invest and you invest in large ticket sizes. You usually don't do Series A, although it's kind of opportunistic. Yeah. No, so. No, no. We're, so G, GR is we're doing very late stage investments, right? So these are companies that are doing 10 million plus in revenue per year. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're big, right? Yeah. And so all, this, all this crowd is did A and some series B, uh, a little bit of seed towards the end. And then before I was at Qualcomm, I was at a seed fund as well, which is I yeah. usually wrote the very first in, institutional yeah. check. So the reason I'm going in that cycle is the the startups that you, you know, that are currently watching uh, that became a part of Startup Istanbul Digital Accelerator Batch are most of them are in very early stages. So from a GR capital standpoint, they they're way off uh, at the moment. It's always good. Uh, exactly. So 
maybe, maybe they will be interesting enough from a personal standpoint or for a referral standpoint for teams that you like. Uh, and maybe you, you're pro probably the most, the uh, most connected person in the uh, VC capital because you did all three, like seed, corporate, and now uh, large ticket sizes. Um, so again, from a fundraising standpoint, what will be your key things uh, if you're looking to very seed very early, pre probably post prototype, uh, not many of them are idea. Yeah. Uh, just kind of want to get your opinion on how they should look into fundraising from seed to growth. Yeah. So, I mean, getting, getting that first, that, that first check is it's, it's really hard. Right. Um, I, I don't want to downplay that. So with my London seed capital hat on, just to kind of share some numbers uh -huh. um, annually, I would look at about a thousand business plans a year, rough numbers. Then I would sit down and probably meet a hundred entrepreneurs face to face, rough. And then as London Seed, we had we had an angel network that sat alongside. So I would uh -huh. find cool companies and, and put them in front of the angels. So the the angel hit rate was slightly higher, but the fund itself, uh, then we would make about eight to ten investments over the course uh -huh. of the again rough rough numbers just to kind of give you an idea of kind of what down looks like so i mean that that's the funnel right from yeah, what was the ticket size average so we were we were a very small investor we would do 100k pounds and then i would usually have an additional 100k from angels sometimes a lot more sometimes it'd be 400k from the angels so we had kind of a 500k max bucket that we would work mm -hmm. with um and so london seed would would act as the the deal lead and i would be the diligence and then i would be on the board etc um easier for the company as well because they're they're negotiating with just one person term sheet mm -hmm. even though i represented multiple parties yeah uh, so i think I mean, that it's important that to have these numbers in mind, it, 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 it is a, an uphill battle. doesn't mean it's an impossible battle at all, but I mean, just, to, it, the, it's tough, right? Um, things have gotten better over the years. Back when I was doing that, there weren't that many seed options out there. Mm -hmm. If you, if you look, you look at uh, the European landscape now, and there's a ton of folks, for example, speed invest, they just announced yeah, yeah. 140 million, 170 million, whatever it was. Yeah, we, we chat with them, uh, I think, a couple of months ago. I mean, it's, you know, un, un, unheard of 10 years ago when, when I was doing yeah. scene. So <clears throat> there, there are a lot more doors to knock on now. Also, you've got uh, a lot of guys that are like me that have you know, left the firm that they were with, set up their own thing. And that tends to be Series A or seed funds. For example, Matias, he just left Atomico to set up. Uh -huh. Yep. Firm. And that's going to be focusing on seed. If you look at Destin, he left Axel. Right. It's a seed fund. So yep. there, there are more doors to knock on these days. So I think the, the next point of it is uh, you've, you're better served getting an introduction to an investor always again go back to my example there's a thousand companies knocking on my door i'm going to talk to 100 if you get an intro from someone that knows me, at least th that email is going to come to the top of the inbox yeah um, and the likelihood of me sitting down is greatly 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 increased yeah I, this this applies for um events <laughs> i realize we don't have so many events right now but it's the same story you know if you if you see a, a vc at startup istanbul and you walk up and go in for the hard pitch uh you've got everything going against you it's loud it's busy um maybe i maybe i'm going on stage in five minutes yeah, yeah. maybe at, at that point i was all calm and you're not doing anything with abilities so it's not even exactly <clears throat> All these things are against you, but at the same situation, if you know one of you guys walks up to me and says, "Hey, Jason, here's this company 
is really in your sweet spot. I think you should spend five minutes with them. And the guy goes, girl, you know, hey, here's my card. I know you're busy. Could we find a time to talk next week? I'm like, yeah, that, 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 that's perfect. Absolutely. Right? And am I going to get on the, on the phone with that entrepreneur? Yes. Am I going to see them face to face? Again, if there aren't. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> you know, Zoom to Zoom. Right. Yeah. So now it's now it's all Zoom, but it's the same story, right? Exactly. If, if if an entrepreneur wants to talk to a specific VC, like get get an intro. And I'm not saying it's easy. Sometimes it can be kind of hard to figure these things out. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm so I, as an investor, we have to raise money from other investors. Yeah. Same story. It's the same story. Um, our time horizons are quite quite longer and I'll, I'll come to that. Yeah. But it, you know, when I'm trying to talk to an investor that I've never met before, I have to figure out a way in because it's the same story. They have hundreds of funds knocking on their door, yeah, yeah. raise their fund two or fund three or whatever. So it, the same rules apply to me. Um, then on the, on the kind of the time horizon, uh, six months is kind of a very good rule of thumb. I closing quicker than that is, I mean, it clearly it does happen, but un, unusual, uh, longer than six months definitely happens as well. Um, I think it, instead now six months is a pretty long time. Yes, yeah, I mean, serious A, serious B, yes, but like in seed stage, yeah, if you can't raise the seed stage in six months, it's not good news, not good news, but and again. For seed specifically, you do have a few doors you can knock on. You have accelerator programs, so exactly. you can, you can get a little bit of money to get the pro to get things rolling. You don't have to go out and raise two or three, four, five hundred. You can get started with you know thirty grand, fifty grand, and do a minimum viable product, and then you can kind of take that out to your seed investor. <clears throat> Hopefully, getting the support from the accelerator that you've worked with. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, that's a tough side. So, um, do you think, well, I think a lot of people are taking the long view on COVID saying it won't affect too much of the ecosystem, especially if their VC funds already established, they have the money, they have to deploy the money. So the money will go somewhere. Maybe the ticket sizes will increase, but on the seed side, when you talk about angels and accelerators, I think we're going to see uh, uh, doomsday. There are some doomsday scenarios for accelerators and seed funds where the angels are going to shy away from doing anything to see what will happen over the next six to nine months. Accelerators will have a hard time finding the angels to invest in the accelerators post-graduation. So mm -hmm. those companies who are not relying on positive unit economics models, but who kind of needs the first uh, kick in uh, for growth and marketing. Um, we'll we'll have some serious issues. Um, how do you see that um, accelerator and seed stage game being played um, post COVID with all the uh, drama? Actually, yeah, yeah. So I I read a report um, Monday um, by PitchBook, <clears throat> and they were really painting this doomsday scenario for for vcs and for the whole kind of ecosystem <clears throat> and i actually I, I i don't really share their opinion i i mean i reached out to the the alumni network from from qualcomm because we, we had offices in us europe india china china uh, right so i could i could get um a, a pulse of what's happening across the world yeah, and and not secondary sources, primary, you know, feet on the street and Beijing. Um, and I'm still waiting for to to get the the various inputs. But the thing is, is I'm actually a little on the bullish side, and the reason is, I think the best some of the best companies that I saw actually happened in 2008 and 2009, which was the last kind of big dip, as it were. So great, really great companies were built uh, in the last decade. And, you know, now I, I look at COVID and I, I see a similar situation, 
where in this case, it's very, very, very abrupt customer adoption and radical shifts that are happening. I mean, this is a virtual conversation, for example. Um, I was supposed to have been on stage with you in, in Istanbul, yeah. right? That didn't happen. So this is actually a time of really abrupt change out there and entrepreneurs are adapting. Traditional companies are adapting and people are like, I wait, I can, I can do a business like this instead. So it's actually a good time to, to be investing. As, as GR, we've, we've just done two deals. When other people are saying, maybe we shouldn't be investing. Like we see really great companies that have, that were doing well before COVID accelerated their businesses and yeah. check, right? So um, I'm slightly bullish on the mark on this kind of the startup. <clears throat> that said, you've got to be cognizant of the fact that some angels may have just had their portfolios obliterated. Although the public markets are, are getting better, um, they could also have like multiple real estate investments. Um, so they, you have to be aware that they actually could be struggling or not. It kind of depends yeah. on. Yeah. Um, so there, there could be a little bit of a knock-on effect there. Uh, also, even for VCs, because as I was saying, you know, we have to talk to investors as well, and these investors are being quite cautious. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Because uh, should we should we write a new check right now? Well, I don't know. Even folks that have closed, <clears throat> closed rounds are, yes. you know, they're reluctant. Capital to, call. They're reluctant to go do capital calls because they may be forcing their LP to crystallize yep. the money and pass yep. it on, on to the startup. So could this cause like knock on effects? Yeah. 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 Probably. Like, you, you've got to keep this in mind. Uh, what am I seeing like inside of our portfolio? Well, I'm seeing cost rationalization. So you have extra people in marketing. Those people aren't in marketing anymore. We have to you know, shrink the cost base. So, I mean, all these things apply <clears throat> even all the way down the, the food chain. <clears throat> As you get to really, really, really seed companies, um, you have to, probably have to dial your budget your budget back maybe you won't be able to raise quite as much um so do i think funding is going to stop definitely not and again some back channels that i have with very early stage investors here in the uk um they're, they're definitely investing accelerating their investment probably would be a strong statement but they're 100 percent uh, maintaining their rhythm of investing so it's i don't think it's all dark skies um, so one aspect of that, if you're a VC or a fundraise and close their fund, you will see so many good opportunities. So I would completely agree that your job is, is no, not different than what it was before, but now it's more maybe crisis management, unit economics focus on trying to vision the team. And if you have the money, you can invest in really good companies. Uh, but if you're a startup and if you're not in that category where you're accelerated by adoption on COVID, let's say you're a travel startup or you're a startup that needs, uh, that doesn't have unit economics positive for a long time and it's, the business model would not allow it for you to do it at the early stages, yeah. then I think there's going to be a, a shift between what kind of startups you'll start seeing. And what would your advice be in to companies if they, are, they had been, uh, I think they need to swallow, some of them need to swallow the hard pill um, early on. Look, that, that's, that's going to be really hard. I'm, just not, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I mean, no, if, you're, if you're in the travel space, no one knows at this point if or when we're going to be traveling again, <clears throat> traveling again. Um, um, that's, that, that, that's just, that's, that's really hard. <laughs> I, I, I can't sugarcoat that one. Um, the same thing, like I said, if you're kind of in the real estate space, um, I mean, a friend of mine runs, uh, companies that are similar to WeWork here in London and he has, he has many 
And I messaged him the other day, you know, hey, how are you doing? And, and the answer is like, it's horrible. You know, he terrible. He has no, no one's going to come get off the space with him. They don't have money to pay their rent. And he has, you know, bid out buildings and his own rent. It's terrible. Will those businesses, will it likely close? <clears throat> it, it, it very well could close. That's a hard pill to swallow. And he's, he's a very smart guy. And, you know, that the spaces that he's that he established are, are pretty amazing. Um, we'll see what happens. Do you think that will create a pressure on, or maybe a reality adjustment to valuations at early stage and seed stage? Yeah, again, I, if, if it's a company that is benefiting from what's happened right now, you're, you're not going to see an adverse valuation impact at all. You're only going to see the opposite. So uh, Qualcomm, we, we were investors in Zoom. We, we actually invested in the seed round. And <laughs> yeah. so at IPO, that was like 150x re result for us. I mean, just phenomenal. And I, I looked at Zoom overnight because it's gone up even more. The PE is now 2,000 plus. Okay. 2,000. So the market is building in just phenomenal upside to this business. And while I don't agree with a, a, two, a PE of 2,000, um, it, you know, it's Zoom is replacing airline travel. It's replacing hotel stays, right? So there's multiple buckets that it's, it's building off of. Have they been penalized in COVID? Absolutely not. Uh, and some similar story for, for our companies are in mobility. Uh, and so, I mean, we're in Glovo and I, they've had incredible growth uh, since COVID started. And Deliveroo is the same story, kind of incredible growth rates. So what I think we'll see is, is a shift in um, the companies that, that can raise, but I think most of the technology companies we're looking at and these, these are tech businesses that are accelerating the digitalization of life, right? And uh, those are the companies that are benefiting. And there's not going to be, a, there's not a valuation hit. Yeah, so much like the case, I think you're also an investor, Ms. Wordsmith. That's also a big one. Yeah, I haven't seen their numbers, but, uh, you know, if you just, Mrs. Wordsmith is... Um, who don't know Mrs. Wordsmith, um, kind of the next thousand words in the English language. You've got all these kids stuck at home with you know, parents have nothing to do. What do you do? Well, you, you get your kids some workbooks and apps to help them improve their vocabulary. Great. It's very COVID friendly. Uh, I'm also in City Mapper. Yes. All right. <laughs> um, how's City Mapper been doing lockdown? Well, not too many people planning routes. However, they did a smart little pivot. And they, well, it's not a pivot, it's a product, uh, product enhancement, which is this uh, mobility index that they've come up with. And so now you can see across all the cities that they're in, you can see how active the, uh, the city is. Like I said, hmm. I look to check on, check on London. Let's, let's, let's check Istanbul. Let's see. Oh, Give me just, let's by the way, let's check this while you do that, I'll, I'll switch my headset for a sec. So London this morning is and Istanbul, let's see. Oh, you're at 25%. Oh, I, I can't hear you now. Oh, we lost you. I think you have to close uh, and uh, open it again, probably uh, of the because of the headset. So let me take uh, Ozan. Uh, all right. 
just uh, closed uh, and open probably because of the headset that happens to me as well frequently <laughs> Uh, so, uh, Ozan was asking uh, great questions, but I would like to add some uh, basic uh, questions while you are evaluating and uh, getting valuation of the startups, especially our early founders uh, who are watching these uh, interview, I mean, uh, chat uh, mm -hmm. with us. Uh, they are very uh, curious about how do you value uh, early startup? And... Uh, <laughs> For example, you have mentioned about the Zoom, uh, which uh, while you were in Qualcomm, of course, Zoom may be an outlier or a kind of different story. How did you value Zoom? So my, my colleague in San Francisco led, led, led the deal, so I wasn't involved in valuing the business. Um, quickly on, on Zoom, uh, it was founded by the previous founder of WebEx. So out of, out of the gate, he'd already had a fantastic exit. Uh, I mean, I, for them specifically, I do remember saying to him when he sent the deal to me, I was like, need another video. Isn't that, isn't that pretty, pretty covered? And he says, look, he's done this business before. He knows all the problems with it. And he is a phenomenal entrepreneur. And I go, okay, if, if, <laughs> if I hadn't seen the product yet, you know, I hadn't met him in person. I was like, okay. I mean, if 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 you really believe in him, it's a seed check, right? The check. I mean, like, why not? <laughs> um, but in the, that's kind of a special case because he had a very very successful exit before. Um, but I, so there there's slightly different rules that apply to repeat entrepreneurs. Um, so, for example, I'm also an angel investor in Argent which is kind of a crypto wallet, um, Itamar. And he was a CEO of Peak Brain Training. So when he, uh, so when he was going to do uh, a new startup after we exited Peak, uh, I, I literally almost gave him the money I, you know, blind. I hadn't even seen the pitch deck when I committed to, to joining the round. And I joined the round based on the fact that I worked with him before. Um, and I, 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 I know him as an entrepreneur and it wasn't just me, it was Index, it was Creandum, like all of the existing investors that had worked with him previously came back in for his next company. Was the, was the, it was a $2 million pound seed round. Um, I, I, I won't say what the pre-money was, but it was, you know, it was pretty ambitious, right? Um, again, diff slightly different rules apply there because he done a company and sold it successfully. So for folks that are just getting started, there tends to be a rule of thumb uh, in terms of valuations because you don't have metrics necessarily to look at, especially in the early, uh, the earliest days. I think probably the, the worst, think about it in dilution sense, which is how I always explain it. The worst you'll see 30, 35% dilution for what, whatever you're raising, whatever the number is. Mm -hmm. um, 20, 25 is probably a bit more normal. If you start getting towards 10% dilution, you, you've done very, very well, right? And so, you know, uh, if you're raising 100 grand and you get a 1 million valuation, that is a very, very good result, right? And Just, uh, by the way, you don't, I mean, you don't really have anything judge the business on so it it really is dilution based more than anything else i mean i there's some really aggressive angels out there that try and take 50 percent of the business uh at, at phase one these are investors i suggest walking away from because that's completely unreasonable 30 35 yeah okay i there's a lot of risk that's going on especially if they are a great angel that can help you with kind of the next path and those introductions etc and they kind of, they're they're earning their ownership in that business more than just cash. Uh, most of the VCs are looking for tenfold return on investment while they are doing uh, uh, early stage or I mean A rounds or C rounds. Mm -hmm. Is there a, a maths behind uh, this uh, expectation? Max or math? Maths, M mathematics, like. Uh, 
Yes, there is math behind it. So again, because VCs go out and raise money from investors, uh, they pitch to the investors what they think their fund is going to return. And in order for the math to work at fund level, um, especially if you're doing seed and A, you're, you're going to have so many deaths. You really need every single deal you do to be a, a, a 10x return minimum. Otherwise, just the math doesn't work, right? Mm. So it, it is math driven. Um, also, you've got you know risk versus return um, at the early stages. I mean, when I write an angel check, literally, I'm looking for a hundred x. Literally, well, have I gotten a hundred x yet? No. <laughs> um, Monzo, I'm in Monzo as well. Last round, put my first investment at thirty x. I think mm -hmm. the valuations have changed a little bit, but still it was, it was pretty skippy. Uh, still not hundred X though, <laughs> but uh, uh, you, you definitely are looking for 10 X as, uh, as a growth stage investor. I mean, we're, we're looking for three X kind of as our baseline five X is really great. And if we happen to knock one out of the park and get a 10 X on one of our deals, I mean, that's, that's like a seed stage fund getting a hundred X, right? Mm -hmm. So you go back to the Zoom example. Uh, I mean, that was a phenomenal outlier for Qualcomm, right? Just, right? They, they just hundred hundred X plus returns. That's it's very unusual. Um, and look at the, and then if you look at the peak, your your peak, not my peak. Peak gangs. Uh, yeah, I saw this morning the early bird was saying that it earned. Uh, that's, that's not my house, by the way. <laughs> that's not, that's not me. Um, returned, I think it was 8x for the fund. I'd, I'd have to double. It was either 5x or 8x for the fund. Again, like insane returns. And I know that um, Creandum and North Zone had very, very, very similar returns profiles because of Spotify. Ozan, we, we have no voice from you, by the way. Still. We used to have. So uh, let me ask why Ozan is uh, technically solving the problem. Um, uh, also, uh, there are lots of... Uh, Ozan? Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Go for it, go for it. I'll, I'll jump in. Um, there are a lot of uh, early so, stage startups here. And they are, ex I mean, they are also uh, uh, having lots of questions. So I know one of the questions is uh, how do they approach to investors? This is very basic question, but very important for, uh, for them. Yeah, so I think I was, I was saying earlier, the best thing you can do is get an introduction to whichever investor it is that you want to talk to. Um, any introduction is better than no introduction. Um, there's social proofs involved, etc. Uh, also, depending on who you're trying to talk to, getting access can be can be tricky. So in intros. I think one of the other things that is very important, because I'm, I'm looking at some of the questions that's come through, can, can we relate this to to the region? Um, so with as an international investor, I would kind of go around to various regions. And when I'm there, I'm not actually looking for seed investments outside of, outside of You know, as far as investments go, seed investors need to be local investors for the most part. Uh, it's pretty unusual to have a seed, except for like Speed Invest, who their model is we invest everywhere. Um, it, it's fairly unusual. You, your angels are definitely going to be local. Every single angel investment that I've made, minus Memphis Meats, all UK based. It's just very normal. So if you're if you're out and you're looking for angel, you need to talk to local versus trying to reach out. Oh. Uh, whatever these guys in London do seed investments, I'm going to get out to them, start locally. 
so uh, to kind of give a little different flavor on that, would you be looking into investing in companies who are only headquartered in UK and there's only the CEO in UK who's trying to fundraise and sell, where the rest of the team is somewhere else? Like the whole mythology of relocating into a place where you have customers and access to finance, where you're yeah. keeping your base and product line somewhere else. Does that still make sense? A hundred percent. I, I, so one of my, so one of my angel deals, um, the CEO actually sits in San Francisco. Um, is that the closer to the customers and the development base is in Lithuania. So it's split, you know, split business. So that happens there, there it's, there it's, it's seed round, um, that they've done, uh, again, kind of up and moving to London just to fundraise. That doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, you, you can stay where you are and build fantastically large businesses. Um, I mean, look at get deer. I mean, this, this, <laughs> these guys are doing very well and they're homegrown heroes. Um, look next door in Romania, UI path, and this is a multi, multi-billion dollar company and they started there. And then they moved once there was customer pool. Um, some other, another seed investment that I made was a Finnish based business. Uh, and they stayed in Finland until there was enough customer pool for them to move to the U S and the reason that I made the investment into the Finnish company was I knew the local investors who had funded them before. And then as Qualcomm, I could come in and, and join the round later. It was a seed yeah. extent. I think the dilemma there is the appetite from, especially if you're a B2B uh, company, uh, the appetite in emerging economies from a customer perspective is literally really difficult. Yeah. St startups that are doing technology businesses in Turkey that I know of, or in Middle East that I know of, are having serious hard time in trying to get to uh, their first proof of concepts into their B2B customers. And they're always treated uh, like, let me not curse on, on this because it's going to be on YouTube and my mom can watch it. Uh, not super encouraging at least. So yeah. that's why what I usually tell to startups is try selling your products outside of your country where the appetite for new technologies from a B2B perspective or even from a B2C perspective mm -hmm. it is high. Don't wait for six months to nine months to get a $10,000 revenue from the largest company in Turkey because that, then you're going to be dead. So thinking how to sell globally first will also be a good way to impress investors. At least that's my advice. I'm kind of checking if I'm bullshitting or not. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely right. Uh, so just to use this Finnish company as, because I didn't do a lot of B2B software investments and they were B2, are B2B. Um, so starting with the base in Finland, they were doing virtual sales to the US because I mean, clearly in Finland is a very, very small country. So their native market was, was tiny. Um, but setting up offices, et cetera, in the U.S. happened much later. And they ultimately ended up exiting to a U.S. acquirer. But that was, you know, after series, multiple years later. And again, they started the journey with local investors to support them, then added some international investors along the way, and then finally moved to the U.S. So I 100% agree with you. Definitely fish for customers elsewhere. It's harder, I'm not going to lie. Uh, you're fighting with locals on the local market. Previously, those locals had the face-to-face -face advantage. Oh, we can argue as to whether or not they have face-to-face -face advantage right now. But um, yep. yeah, definitely try and expand your sales internationally, for sure. Um, a few of the startups were telling me what took them like three to four months to get a meeting with the procurement officer or CIO or CTO is now in, in, a, in a week because now everybody's, they don't have a office agenda. They can't say, oh, I'm very busy today. So like, yeah, of course, everybody's a little bit, the, the work life balance has also shifted. So everybody's like, they're not commuting. So they have at least in Istanbul 
and probably Nena as well, two hours more time to, to do stuff, well, either for themselves or for their company. So it became, uh, it kind of democratized the, the sales procedure, the sales funnel seeking. So that is a good advantage. Maybe it will, but. I mean, I, I mean, for me, like the, the calls that I try and have, and I've, I've actually found that there is much more availability, um, you know, for people that I'm, tr I'm trying to talk to. And I, there's a lot of efficiencies that we've gained by being at home all the time beyond just the commute. Like normally I would be jumping around between different meetings to go see different companies. And that's all time that I get back. I'm not spending 40 minutes or an hour you know, going to see this company and then another 40 minutes, an hour coming back. That's, I don't have that dead time anymore. You know, you close the browser, open the browser, done. Huh. It's, I, I think it's actually kind of a, a good time to be doing sales. Again, um, one of the portfolio companies is seeing kind of accelerated B2B sales for this exact reason, because people actually have time to look at the products and test things instead of mind-numbing meetings that probably didn't need to happen. Yeah. And of course, the another challenge was bringing like five people to very in one meeting from one company. Even without externals, you can't get five people from the same company into the same meeting room. It takes two weeks to schedule with assistants and uh, PAs and everything. So it's a, it was a challenge. Yeah. So there is a good question. So I was uh, I interrupted your uh, nice uh, chat, but uh, do investors read all pitching emails? How many minutes averagely do you spend on a pitching cold email? Yeah. And how do you decide, for example, to meet with an uh, with a um, startup? Uh, do you get recommendations or do you meet on the conferences or uh, what is the opportunity, possibility, possibility that an uh, entrepreneur sends you an email and get a meeting? Yeah. So, again, cold email, it, it's the hardest approach, right? Uh, do, I, do I read them all? I'm reading it. Actually, I get pretty close to reading all of them. If I, if I don't read it, I've... I just overlooked. Uh, I also get hit on LinkedIn. I get hit on Twitter. So it's not just email input. And I'm not going to lie. I have a lot of unread messages on LinkedIn because it is 100% unsolicited. Anybody can send it. You don't even have to figure out the email address. Not that I'm trying to be funny. Uh, yeah. I I, but I, I do try and answer, read and answer. Usually when it's unsolicited, it tends to not be a very good fit. I mean, they're just grasping at straws, right? Uh, again, I understand when entrepreneurs can do that, but not, probably not such a good fit. If, if I feel that they really done the research on me, they read really studied the, the fund's website and they see the portfolio companies and it, it's a well-crafted pitch, I definitely will answer for sure. And then in terms of getting on calls, et cetera, uh, I mean, I, I've asked, even over Twitter, I've asked people, you know, hey, that's that's kind of interesting. Could you send me your business, you know, your slide deck, particular email, and, I'll, and then I'll spend some more time. So I, the thing is with, with investors, you're always interested in kind of getting to the next step. It's not, it's not high club. It's high you my day. You've seen my slide deck. We have a call. We've had a call. Got I got to get more like financial information. So it's you, you want to move people in the process. So do you prefer to get the pitch deck or an executive summary? Um I, I prefer to have a very succinct, small uh, summary. Uh, how to, do you, do you want to answer some of these? How to reach investors' emails. Well, guessing. Guessing is a very good trick. But <laughs> what I was saying is it's better to, to get an intro to them. I mean, again, there are people that I try and reach out to, so investors for me, and I don't 
reach out to them uh, cold. I get a warm intro because these people manage a lot of money and they're very busy and I don't expect them to respond to a guy that they don't know. If they if I get a warm intro, then they're likely to respond to me. So it's, it's the same applies for startups. Um, try, try and get an intro. And also you can ask investor A that you're talking to if it's not good for them. You say, well, I realize that we're not a great fit for you. Do, can you think of maybe one other investor that I, that I should talk to? And that, that's a great great way to get another name that you probably should be talking to so you're closer to their um, investment thesis. Uh, also, if you're really lucky, that investor might introduce you to the other investor. If they genuinely like your business, like, ah, it's just not a really good fit for us, but oh, you'd be a great fit for these guys over here. Well, let me send an intro. I've definitely done that in the past. But I think the founder has to be likable in order to have you introduce to another investor. Yeah, because I mean, there's a little bit of um, stamp of approval if you send it, send it through. It's there's social currency there for sure. It's not, it's not unheard of. It happens for sure. Um, I mean, it, and again, I'm kind of a late stage investor, so when I see something that's very early, I go, "Oh, actually, you're very early for us." But let me introduce you to these guys over here. They might be interested in what you're doing. I've done that. Jim. Uh what are the uh, uh, quotations means no when you talk with an investor? Such as, <laughs> keep, let's keep in touch. Is it no? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I wrote a whole blog post on this, uh, on the various versions of no. Uh, let's stay in touch definitely means no, but it's, it's, it's more of a not now than a no, right? This is an email that that I send pretty regularly. Like, you know, let's let's stay in touch for the next for the next round. Late stage. And for example, um, if you say you are not uh, fitted our mandate, but you are a good company, is mm -hmm. it, it? Does it mean no? No, it does mean no. Yeah. If so, for example, uh, as GR. We invest into Western European companies, and then we help them enter Eastern Europe, right? So when uh, a Turkish company approaches me and says, hi, I have a business. I would like you to invest. And I go, no, you don't fit our mandate. We go from West to East. And if I invest into East, in East, then the promises that I've made to my investors are now all false. So it's not a good, it has nothing to do with the business. It could be the best business on the planet. It doesn't fit our particular mandate, right? Same thing with my Qualcomm hat on. Um, we were doing all things related to kind of mobility and mobile handsets, et cetera. You know, it could be this great marketplace business that's in fashion. And I look at it and go, you have a fantastic business. 100% not for us. And also, how do you follow up, monitor the startups after, for example, you said, let's keep in touch? Uh, do you expect them to send you an update? How should be the update email look like? Or do you actively follow them on email or a, or a CRM service that you are using? So uh, a little bit of both. I have a CRM that, that tracks the companies that, I, that, I, that I'm actively interested in. Um, but also I will say very, very, very explicitly, please keep me on your I'm interested list when you when you do the next round. So, for example, I mean, right now there's interest in um, uh, convertible loan notes and interim rounds, et cetera, for the companies that aren't quite into our sweet spot. So north of 10 million, say, so a company with 8 million in revenue messages me and I really like the space that they're in. This is a, this is a live conversation that's happened recently. Really like the business, really like the product, really like where they're going. So it actually is genuinely too early for us, but by about this much. So please keep me on your I am interested list and let me know as soon as you do the next round because your metrics will probably be what we're looking for and I can I can really engage with you at that point. Mm -hmm. Super explicit about it. 
However, Perfect. if you're an, if you're an angel and you go, well, you know, talk to oh. Brown. Well, <laughs> maybe that's maybe that's a no. How, how long does a term sheet last? I mean, which means, uh, for example, from sending a term sheet agreement to the agreement process. And should you tell about very roughly what are the steps for investors and founders, especially the first time term sheet uh, uh, sig uh, uh, signed uh, startups? Sorry, you asked me the timeline from signing the term sheet to signing the final. Yes, and also, uh, what should the founders, or I mean, uh, inexper unexperienced founders, should be taking care uh, the important points? Right. So there are a couple of sources of very standardized documents available now. Um, C Legals, I think, has one. I think C Camp has one. There, there are a couple of uh, firms that these are published uh, term sheets, so and actual legal documentation. So if you're a first-time founder, you can go and and kind of look at kind of standard models. Um, also, I really would recommend using those standard templates to 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 do the legal process. Legals. Um, can take quite a lot of time. Um, it's, it is, uh, my lawyer friends would hate me for saying this, but I mean, it's pretty cookie cutter stuff, especially at seed and series a, it's not a lot, a, a soft bank deal. That's, you know, 500 million in financing. This is very specialized stuff. Those are complex legals, but if you're doing a seed round or an yeah, angel round, you, you don't need really complicated stuff. Um, so there are publicly available documents. I recommend using them. If you don't, you're looking at a process that is going to take probably two to three months by the time you do all the back and forth and forth and back, um, from starting point to final documents that you're signing, it, it's going to take a while. So you can shortcut that. Um, and using standardized documents mean this may be a two week process. One of the other things is you really want to agree as much as possible in the term sheet with the investor, right? If there are kind of key provisions that an investor wants to have controls in terms of uh, <clears throat> budgetary expense or um, first right of refusal, whatever it is that they're looking for, you actually want that in the term sheet. Because if you can agree the term sheet early, then when you get to legal's process, it's actually quite, quite, it can be faster. Perfect. I mean, these are uh, my questions. Ozan, do you have more? Yes, there is one more. With potential investing on late stage communication. I, I have a lot more, but maybe just a warning to the founders. If, well, study, do, do your due diligence on the investors. Don't just start sending decks to investors that are that are not investing in you because they have a mandate don't don't waste your time and also um if you're going to ask for advice it's different but if you're asking for money make sure that they have the right mandate to help you and the right right focus on, especially on the ticket sizes Ozan, this is a great point i uh, frequently see founders sending uh, a template of email without uh, any work uh, uh, I mean, they, they don't study the investor. They have a template of, uh, and they do mail merge. Uh, probably they got the uh, email list somewhere. There are lots of uh, lists on the in internet. And um, without um, working out uh, the investor mandates and fund and portfolio companies, they think that all the investors are investors like uh, money and they do investments anywhere. But uh, especially from looking from the VC side, they have their mandates and their term sheets and they have LPs. So they are also uh, connected to their uh, agreements. So they do not do, uh, they have uh, sectoral or vertical or country-based uh, limitations. And this doesn't work. If they send 100 emails, I mean, probably no one will uh, uh, send a reply to them and they are demotivated then. Uh, I mean, most of the frequently uh, made uh, mistake is that in my point of view, especially in the early stages, the A, B rounds are of course uh, very different. Hmm. Um, 
Yes, yeah, so should we address these, these last questions? Yes. This is the last question. So, Jason, um, thank you very much for this call. I mean, it is uh, already an hour. Uh, we, so, uh, we really thank you uh, for your valuable time. Very happy to be here. I, I hope some of the stuff that I shared is helpful for at least one, one person on the call. Ozan, thank, thank you very much. And uh, it is good to see you again. Jason, hope to see you if uh, this pandemic outbreak completes, and we will hope to see you face to face in Istanbul uh, in fall, hopefully. That'd be great. Thank All you. Right. Bye bye. Thanks, guys. Bye bye. bye.